is a man, a well-known man, and you can read about his impressive biography in your program by the name of uh, Dr. Chip Espinoza. To introduce him, I would like to quote from one of the books he co-authored, a book that I would recommend to every manager who manages millennials and to every millennial who works for a boomer manager. You will learn some great insights about each other. Gabriel Jackson Boche is a millennial, and I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs uh, of how she introduces uh, this book. Generations are not created in a vacuum. They are imperfect production of parents, pop culture, and politics. Millennials were born into an economic boom and graduated into a major bust. We were raised on the internet. We live in a world where knowledge is borderless and information platforms keep facts fluid. Today's managers look at this generation with amusement and confusion. To them, we are terrifying, strange, and inspiring. A quick Google search on millennials and, and your browser is flooded with headlines. Millennials expect a raise and promotion in year one. Here come the millennials. Are you ready for their ego? Expecting loyalty from Gen Y may be expecting too much. The critics have it wrong. When I look out at my generation, I don't see selfish, lazy, and flaky kids. I see individuals passionate about justice, committed to making a difference, and ready to be taken seriously. Millennials refuse to accept the status quo. We want careers that crisscross industries. We trust leaders with raw authenticity. We crave experiences that last more than moments. Our favorite verbs are disrupt, dream, digitize, and sustain. The man who can speak far more eloquently about this is our next speaker, Dr. Chip Espinoza. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate that introduction. And um, it's such a pleasure to be with you here today. And I love the Siebert Foundation. I was able to talk a few months ago about a study they were doing and helping them get their sample together. But what a joy to work with. And so it is my privilege to be here with you today. People ask me, how did you get interested in generational diversity? And the answer is, I'm a university professor. I noticed a difference between my students in the 1990s and the 2000s. In the 1990s, when I handed out a syllabus on that first day of class, they grabbed it, threw it in their backpack, never looked at it again. In the 2000s, they would get that syllabus, they'd get a red pin out, they'd get their attorney on speed dial, and they'd go line by line through that syllabus and say, this 10 to 12 page assignment is 10 pages of C and 12 pages in A? Or how many classes can I miss and still get an A? Now, I had some colleagues that were a little off put, by their, off put by their behavior, but I saw them as coming engagement ready, wanting to participate. And they also came with this notion, everything's negotiable, right? So I wondered, as I studied, those students challenged me. They said, you're the one interested in generational diversity. Why don't you go out and do research and, and write about it? And so I'm really, everything that I do today, pretty much is at the challenge of that group of millennial students who said, you can make a difference. So I'm always going to be grateful to them. So out of my research, I wrote a book called Managing the Millennials. And that was really to help managers to better understand them, their values that they interpret as being kind of negative, but they're really positive deep down. And then I started to get asked questions like, uh, what, what, what do young professionals need to do to change in the marketplace, to be effective? And so I did international research and wrote Millennials at Work, which shares some challenges that they experience. And then I started getting asked questions at the end of my talks that said, what if you're a millennial and you manage baby boomers and you just don't get them? And so I wrote uh, Millennials Who Manage for that. One of the most sobering questions or statements that I've heard recently, though, came from my son. 
He's volunteer on the worship team at Saddleback Church in um, Southern California. And he got invited to a meeting of all the big pastors. And I was excited for him because I thought, man, this is going to be neat to find out, man, how does that church operate? What do they talk about in their meetings? And so when he gets home, I said, Chance, what would you think? He goes, he goes, it was really interesting, Dad. I liked it. And, you know, great people. He said, but your generation doesn't trust my generation to reach my generation for Christ. And I stopped and I said, what do you mean by that? He says, I don't think we have all the answers, but I think we have something to say, but it just seems that nobody wants to listen. They're all talking about how they can do ministry to us and for us, but not with us. Well, this isn't new. 1 Timothy 4.12, right? What does Paul say to Timothy? He says, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Why did he say that? Because we look down on people that are young. He says, don't give them a reason to. This isn't new. There's a term for it. Now, I love this term. Norman Ryder, out of the University of Nebraska, sociologist, came up with this in 1965. And if I had a rock band, this is what I would name it. <laughs> Demographic metabolism. Huh? And what it means is when you have an aging generation moving out of the leadership of our institutions and younger generations following, you have the potential for tension in conflict, a difference in ideas and strategies. And he said, it's that tension, how it's handled, whether it becomes constructive for our organizations and institutions, or it becomes destructive. So what my work is committed to is to say, how can we better understand each other is generations. Now, most of the focus today will be on a younger generation. Why? Because they're the latest into the sandbox. And so to try to understand and say, how can we best minister with one another is our objective. Now, the generations at a glance, in case you're wondering, and many of you have probably already read about this subject, and you'll see different years. And I'm just going to give a disclaimer. Generational analysis is not an exact science, right? It's just not. It's sociology. And so you'll see different years, but normally there's sentient boundaries on the years. And so you'll... Most people have millennials at 80 to 2000. I have them at 83 to 2001 because my publisher has five books in the genre and they all want us to be the same. So that's the science behind that, okay? <laughs> so if you're here and you were born in 1982 and you want to be a millennial, be a millennial, okay? <laughs> Don't let anybody stop you. But you can see from the builders, 26 to 45, there's a little less than a million of them left in the workforce in the U.S. Baby boomers, 46 to 64, now accelerating their retirement. Generation X, 65 to 1982. Millennials, 83 to 2001. And then the next generation, Gen Z, is projected to be a little over, uh, they'll be 20, 2002 to 2020. Probably the eldest of them are maybe freshmen, sophomore in college right now. Generational theory, and one of the things that I wanted to establish in, in what I think differentiates part of what I do, is that I think we need a theoretical framework for speaking about challenges that we have. We can't just talk about what people are like. A lot of what is being said is generalization. Just because you're a certain age doesn't mean you're all the same. It's just that the perceptions of our ages create a reality if they're acted upon if we don't seek to understand each other. And so when we look at this generational theory, Carl Mannheim, he was a German sociologist, wrote a paper in 1923 called The Problem with Generations, and he said, generational location points to certain definite modes of behavior, feeling, and lot. So people that are of a similar age, and at that time in a similar geographic area, experiencing socioeconomic events, it would shape a worldview for that generation. And so that's where the thought comes from. Now, why it's so popular today, I think, versus maybe in the transition between other generations, is look at the demographics. When you see this chart up here, you can see the builders were uh, just a little under 60 million. Yeah, the baby boomers almost 80 million. 
Gen X, a little over 60 million, and the millennials at over 80 million. Now, in group norm theory, it's a sociological concept, it says that the large group is the dominant group. And the dominant group gets to do what? Make the rules. Set the agenda. And anybody who defies them gets punished. And so, who do you think today, where do you think the most tension between generation is? Which two generations? Baby boomers and millennials. You are a bright audience, okay? And the issue is because the baby boomer has been large and in charge for over three decades. The way the baby boomer wants to do church is the way we do church. And now the millennials are coming in and said, this is the way we want to do church. And we think our way is better than your way. And so what you have is this tension over the agenda. Now, for those of you in Gen X out here, I call you relationship brokers. Okay? Because you can interpret baby boomers to millennials and interpret millennials to baby boomers. And so you're, you're that person. I, I think if we did not have Gen X, we would have UFC fighting in our institutions every day, right? They're able to kind of bring it together. Here's the biggest reason why I think we're talking so much about this topic. Millennials are the first generation who has not needed an authority figure to access information. It changes the dynamics of relationship to authority. Think about it. The first place they're going to go with a question is where? Google. Google. The last place they're going to go to a question is to an authority figure. And the way authority figures interpret that behavior is that they don't care or that they're disrespectful. That's not what's going on here at all. It's just that they've been taught to explore and to look everywhere before they go to an authority figure. Now, let me tell you something. When I was growing up, and I, was, I, I started out as, in the ministry, I was a youth minister, became an executive pastor. In order for me to have upward mobility and opportunity, I had to find someone older than me and suck up to them, right? Come on, who else has done that? I'm not the only one. So here's what happened. You see, if you don't have a felt need for authority figures, you don't learn how to relate to them. And if you don't have that felt need, you don't learn how to communicate with them. One of the biggest challenges between the generations, particularly the millennial and older generations, is communication. Because one in five, in my research, were great at it. They're the ones that get the attention, the raise, the bonus, get hired first, all those things, listen to. The four out of five are just as talented, but don't have that skill set. So we've got a generation of authority figures waiting for younger people to come to them and ask them questions. And don't feel like it's their responsibility to initiate the relationship. And then we have a younger person who doesn't know how to do it. There's another challenge here. And what I'm sharing with you is basically some provocative propositions to think about in your ministry life. I think to departmentalization and specialization in church is where church growth was 60s, 70s, 80s. This was the big movement. And I, I think age-appropriate teaching, all, I think it's all good, but we always have to look at unintended consequences of something good. And I think one of the unintended consequences of this is when is it that we get all of our generations worshiping together? I remember growing up going to potlucks. That's when it happened. I haven't been to a potluck in 50 years. Well, I'm not that old, but I haven't been. Yes, I am that old. <laughs> but the issue is, how is it that we are intentionally getting the different generations together for worship just to build relationships in that context? Here are the challenges out of my second book that millennials face. And I want to share these with you in case you're doing mentoring, coaching, helping, or you have younger uh, professionals that are working with you in the ministry. The number one challenge they face is lack of experience. That's what they're told all the time. You lack experience. This is why we're not going to listen to you. This is why you're not going to get the respect you need. You lack experience. This is what they say about themselves. They lack experience. Why is it that we point out the one thing they already know about themselves when we work with them? All we do is create barriers of engagement when we point out a lack of experience. But the one thing off this list I'm just going to pick off, because I don't have the time, is processes. 
they will come in and criticize everything you're doing day one. I love them for that. You know what? If you hire a young person who isn't challenging your way of doing things, they're not giving 100%. Right? The reason they come in like that is because they want to be a part of what you're doing. They don't just want to be the status quo or sustain your ministry of what you've already done. They want to be a part of the today and now in the future and be able to look to something to say, this is where I was able to be involved. This is my handprint in this ministry. We have to provide room. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The organizations that I find at greatest risk are legacy organizations, and particularly nonprofits. Why? Because we have this idea of the way we've always done it is the way it should always be done. And that these new voices coming in, rather than deal with the challenge of today's society in reaching it, we'd rather explain that it's not a problem. Now, a couple more slides. One in five millennials say they were raised in a religion but are now unaffiliated with a particular faith, which is where the term nuns came from. They don't have any affiliation. They're more unaffiliated than the previous generations. This is out of Pew Research and Berkeley Center of Religion. Less than 50% of millennials say that religion is very important in their lives. Among millennials who are affiliated with religion, however, the intensity of their commitment is the same as other generations, right? So getting them in and getting them involved. Ministering with millennials requires overcoming the bias of our own experience. I think that's the key to engagement. But overcoming the bias of our own experience is the way I did it or we did it coming up is the way that everybody else has to do it. Because if we can't suspend the bias of our own experience, we can't ask ourselves questions like, how do I need to change? What do I need to do differently? Or why do their values disturb me? We have to be able, not only as individuals, to overcome the bias of our own experience, but we have to, as organizations, to sit down and have conversations to say, where is it that we may be inhibiting the full engagement of all the generations in our congregation? Now, the argument against everything I'm saying is maturational theory. It comes out of developmental psychology. And what it says is that people, they get their values, attitudes, and behaviors as a function of aging, not sociologically. And so it says if you're one years old, you should be talking by the time you're, I mean, one years old, you should be walking. By the time you're two, you should be talking. By the time you're six, you shouldn't be telling huge lies in school. By the time you're 18, you should graduate high school. 22, graduate college. 23, be married. 25, have a mortgage and a kid, right? Does that sound like today's young professional? No. Guess what? They're putting off seven years what every other generation did before them. Matter of fact, psychologists are talking about adding a life stage between adolescence and young adulthood and calling it emerging adulthood to account for that seven years. But here's the scary thing, and I, I'm just going to baseline it with you. I've worked with some large denominations, and they default to maturational theory instead of trying to better understand this younger generation and engage them where they are. And when you default to maturation, maturational theory, it says this. Well, when they get old enough, and they get burdened enough financially, and have a family, then they're going to come and start thinking like us and worshiping with us. And I'm telling you, I would not put money on that. Okay? I wouldn't. The issue is that we have to look at this and say we cannot just say and put it off because we're wasting. Let's say they do get old and they start thinking like us. We've wasted seven to ten years of engagement of discipleship, of relationship with them. So, let's not have a conversation about millennials, but with them. Let's not focus on just ministering to millennials, but ministering with them. And the most 
important thing we could ever do is build a relationship with them. Thank you very much. Now we have the privilege of listening to people that actually do what I talk about. And so I would like to invite Fred, Amy, and Paul up to the um, platform. And what we're going to do is I'm going to trigger each of them with a question that they're going to share out of their own ministry experience. And then what we're going to go to is a couple of general questions that I have of the panel. And then after that, we'll take questions from the audience. That sound good? All right, let's do it. Okay, so to begin with, I'm going to start with Fred. Fred, organizations often ask me the question when they call me up. They say, what are, what are the, what's the silver bullet to keeping young professionals or attracting them? And I always say two things are the most important things. One, career development is their love language. If you don't have a plan for them, you're not going to keep them. And the other is the quality of relationship they have with their boss or manager. Do you see that in your ministry? In what ways? Do you want me to? Yes. Yeah, it, go to the platform. Or no, we have a mic here for you. If you want to sit down, whatever you want to do. I think I'll sit. No, Test. I'm good. I yep. think I'm good here. Okay. I think that'll work just fine. Um, I want to back into uh, Chip's question because it took us a while to get to it. Um, to figure that out. You know, if I'd been asked to be on a panel like this three years ago, I would have stood here and I would have told you a story of hope, of a, of a little two-talent congregation. It would have been uh, because over 15 years, my wife and I were privileged to co-lead uh, a small, hidden, spiritually complacent Lutheran congregation, 45, through some bold risk-taking uh, to steady, organic turnaround. I would have told you had we doubled in size and tripled in size, they went to five times the size at two, now three locations, and virtually all of them through uh, 20 and 30 somethings. Do I have the. And that would have shown up on our, uh, on our website. I would have told you that it wasn't about numbers, it was all about making more and better disciples, about following Jesus and empowering 20 and 30 somethings and, and changing lives. And I would have stood here and I would have been humbled to be here as I am today, but I would have been excited and a little bit proud to be able to share a story of hope for literally thousands of congregations just like ours in the same kind of situation. That's three years ago. If I'd been asked to be on a panel like this one year ago, I, I would have declined. Out of frustration, out of embarrassment, out of confusion, we weren't growing any longer, we were shrinking. And it wasn't just the numbers, our generational focus on 20 and 30 some things, it wasn't resonating like it had just three or four years before not with outsiders, not even with our own 20 and 30-somethings. Um, and that was going on, but it was like there was even a, a deeper question I couldn't shake. Were we really, as this one, were we really helping people grow as disciples? Were they growing in faith? Were they growing in Christ-likeness? Were they growing more loving? Or were we just busy? <laughs> and if we're not doing that, what are we really doing? I, maybe you ask yourself that question sometimes. Uh, couldn't shake it, and as leaders, we felt we shouldn't shake it. So long story short, we came across something called the Reveal Survey, where people report on their spiritual life and the church's role in it. Several thousand churches have done it. Over half a million people have participated in it. It's not perfect, but it's really good. <laughs> and it revealed something to us, uh, crucial, some important truths to us about ourselves. In, in a nutshell, this research has given us a kind of helpful framework, and language to describe spiritual growth and a spiritual growth continuum for each of us personally. Um, this is, this is uh, for folks that are kind of in our churches, in our churches, uh, and there's, we use some kind of language. This is, uh, comes out of the Reveal survey. People who would be explorers would say things like, I believe in God. I'm not sure about the Jesus thing. Uh, I'm working on what it means to, to know. To, to, my, my faith isn't a significant part of my life, but I'm open, I'm exploring. Somewhere along the way, people, some can find themselves at growing in Christ, I believe in Jesus, I'm working on what it means to get to know him. I'm committed to learning more. For some of us can find at a certain point in our life, we're able to say, it's different now. 
close to Christ. I feel close to Christ. I depend on him daily for guidance. Well, not daily, but it's different. And then some can find that they're at a stage to say to Christ centered, my relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship in my life. It shapes and guides everything. Well, not everything. Because sin has shot through this whole thing. But you see there's, and sometimes we're wildly all over the spectrum, but there's something about maturation and growth. It gave us language. It gave us a kind of a way to quickly say, where am I? I'm kind of in between these two places. They did that. The researchers helped us do that. And they also developed a spiritual vitality index that would gauge the kind of spiritual maturity of a congregation, a snapshot of that, right? Measuring two things. How well are we doing, church? And how well are... Is the, how good is the spiritual vitality of the people in our church? If you want to know how we rated ourselves, how we came out, circle complacent. <laughs> of all these kind of archetypes of a church can be vibrant or self-motivated or energized or extroverted. Before the results came in, I was saying, please, please let us at least be average. <laughs> <laughs> complacent, meaning where people are relatively comfortable with the way church operates, but not many of us, not enough of us are growing spiritually. Meaning, in 17 years, my wife Carol and I had managed to take a small, complacent, spiritually complacent Lutheran church and make it five times bigger. Still, a spiritually complacent church, and that felt horrible. And so for me, it was a kind of double reaction of, oh no. Well, I said something else, but um, <laughs> we tried so hard to be intentional about that. But then, OK, game on. Let's do something about this. What do we do? And what's really going on? So we dug in deeper. Here's what we saw. Here were some of our results. And if you can see the graph, and so of these kind of four places at which people can kind of uh, land, sort of exploring, growing in Christ, close to Christ, Christ-centered. We're not even with the disconnected people on the outside. This is inside the church. We were lopsided way towards way more folks who are spiritually immature. Meaning what? Meaning our folks are stuck, or they're stalled, or they're hung up somehow in the earlier end of spiritual growth. And we tried to visualize what's really going on. What are we doing that's cr helping create this situation? I think it's easier if you can kind of visualize it for yourself. We, we call it the discipleship funnel. I want to walk you through a couple of quick sides because I think it's core for us to say, ooh, this is what's been going on for a long time. So I want to show you this first thing. These are the people that are disconnected. A lot of the, the nuns are looking at church and they don't know what it is. You know, there's a big wide end of the funnel. I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into. I can't see the help I need here. I don't know how to connect. I'm not going to connect. That's the experience of many people that are, that are disconnected. They can't see the personal help that's waiting there for them. But for the people who do come through our doors, I'm talking about our church. Maybe it describes yours. It's like this. Okay, I'll check it out. They come in through the wide end of the funnel, the Sunday morning large group worship experience, and this experience in people's minds gets equated with church or with the spiritual growth or with a Christian life, right? That's it. And the newcomer comes in, or our insiders come in, and they say, they experience that, and they say, OK, I'm good. I'll be back when I want more. Or I'm more, uh, later might be six weeks later, might be three weeks later, might be six months later. Or you know what? This isn't really feeding me. I'm out. Some people say, I'm into this. This is OK. I mean, I'll try it out. I keep hearing in the bulletin about this small group or fellowship events or service events or devotions or things I ought to be doing, right? I'll give these a try. And they get a little further down the funnel. And they say, I guess that's what you want from me, right? There's no picture of their destination of who they're becoming. Some people on the bottom of the, of the diagrams say, I'm still into this, but I'm stuck. Maybe I'll ask for help. Maybe. Maybe not. Too many people are getting hung up in our discipleship making funnel. And our aha moment came when we asked ourselves the question, what if we just flip the funnel? What if we flip the funnel and started on the personal end? And this is where things change, and I think where the generational connection for us comes in. We, um, what if we 
flip the funnel and put personalized spiritual growth coaching at the front end. So the newcomer meets with a spiritual coach in a way someone in AA meets with a sponsor, right? That relationship gets associated with helping people find a life that matters and loving God and loving other people more. Developing a personal plan through different catalysts, different things that will help trigger some growth. It'll involve coming to worship. It'll involve serving in small groups and personal practices, but it's as part of their personal plan from their going from where they are to the new them and to a new community. And so we say things like this. We know how it feels to go through the motions, right? You were, went, you were meant for so much more. We'll help you find a, a path to a better life and to a life that matters, a better way to live. Schedule some free spiritual coaching, and we'll get you going on some things like that. And we find ourselves at that kind of, as a, as a church, at a kind of persevere or pivot moment. Are we going to keep going with what we're doing, or are we going to really change it? And we really changed it. And we said we're going to flip the funnel, and we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to operate very differently. It's kind of moving people. We want to move people from three to eight, so many of our folks, and address our our congregation spiritual uh, complacency head on. So how does it work? But I want to just tease you with that and not give you a sense of, of what, <laughs> what, what's involved in it. And what, what do we actually do when I, when, I use, when I use language like that? So in a nutshell, spiritual growth coaching uh, functions this way. Uh, it starts with people's own self-assessment. This is for, both for people, I coach people that are outside the church um, and, I, and, and people inside the church, and we, a bunch of us do. And it starts with a self-assessment of where are you? Where would you find yourself? Disconnected, exploring, growing. Where do you say you are most of the time? What do you, and then what do you want to go? Do you want to grow? Do you have some inner desire for something to happen? Do you want to grow? And then we help give them things like these different growth catalysts. It's like a menu of options. What might work for you next? Is it something to do with church? Is it some personal practice that you would do? Is it serving with other people? What would be the pathway that would be helpful for you? And then we, we start to offer, where, what are you ready to grow in right now? We use kind of classic coaching techniques to help people identify goals and, and where they're stuck and what options they have and get them on a monthly plan to do something. What will you do next? But here's the key. There's an ongoing personal coaching relationship because everybody that we've coached gets stuck. And you come back and say, I didn't really do much this last month, but OK, we're meeting. Let's get going again. The challenge, the accountability, the cadence of accountability, the person that's there for you. We meet anywhere from monthly to quarterly for about an hour. Depends on the person. In case you're wondering, and as far as the congregation, we started in March. A little over 40% of the congregation is engaged in doing it. Um, some outsiders have, more starting every week. I'm hoping, I'm guessing, another 20 or 30 percent will uh, come on board in the next six months. Some clearly are not interested, right? I'm okay where I am. That's the kind of complacency where I'm kind of doing it myself. Some understandably are wary. I don't know what this is. I don't know what I'm getting myself into. But I'll tell you what's changing that in terms of congregational culture. They're hearing from other people saying, I met with my coach, it's going well, things are happening, right? That testimony thing, is, it's huge. Um, bottom line, uh, we're doing it and people really love it. Why? Because it works. People are working through their usual place of stuckness. Everybody in our, I, virtually everybody I know is stuck somehow. And they're getting past them, they're seeing change, they get excited about it, they get momentum. Long, long uh, desired behaviors are changing. Bible reading, prayer life, taking on challenges, all those kinds of things, and God's honoring that desire. From the other side, let me just say this. If you're ever even thinking that something like this might be helpful for you, it is, for our staff, I think we're saying it's maybe it's the most valuable thing we do all week. These are the conversations we always thought we wanted to have, we're going to be able to have with people in our congregation, and we never seem to have them. Now we have a system for having them, and it's, you know, Carol said, can we start over? <laughs> 18 years in, why did it take us so long to do something like this? Week by week, it's becoming a part of who we are. We're busy reproducing coaches. We've got seven. We need 15 or 20 for this to work in the long run. I'm finally 
finally answering your question, Chip. Younger generation has challenges getting into this, but the, it is just on the sur surface of it so obvious for them um, as, as this fusion of disciple making, uh, pastoral care that they get. They appreciate it, they respond to it. It's investing in their own life. And it's something they, I think, can see themselves doing for somebody else. Then just then they can do it with us. Uh, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Brad, thank you so much. And I can't tell you. When we spoke in preparation for the panel, just so like all of us did, but when he said that to me, I thought, man alive, what a phenomenal idea. Because I think it so much resonates, resonates with them. Anyway. So our next, uh, our next speaker is going to be, Amy is an InterVarsity Ministry Director, important person. I know that much. <laughs> and my conversation with her, I'm always fascinated with people that are face-to-face -face with this population every day and what they do. Not only from the work staff side, but from the people that they're ministering with. And, and so I, I'm interested, have you noticed a change or difference in the students you're ministering with and to today from the ones when you first started? This is where I say no, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that's what I'm going to say because actually that's not true. Um, though I like your business card idea, I think I'm going to say university important person. <laughs> so... Uh, so I've been on the college campus. The college campus is my mission field. That's my congregation, and I've been on staff with InterVarsity for the past 15 years. Uh, kind of first uh, got introduced to the interdenominational ministry as a college student myself. Um, but yeah, I have been working professionally with them for the last 15 years. Um, college students are not the same today that they were 15 years ago or 10 years ago, or even five. They're simply not the same. The college campus and people are not static. They're dynamic, so they do change. So I was thinking about, okay, what was like, so this morning, um, in the talk this morning, they kind of talked about the huge implications of 2007 and the coming of the iPhone and the proliferation you know, that word, <laughs> of Facebook in 2007, and that was huge. And as I think back into my early years of ministry on the college campus, that was one of the first adaptations we had to make was around technology and social media. One of the first things we began to notice is that college students didn't know how to have face-to-face -face conversation. It wasn't a skill that they had been developed in them. They, they were more comfortable communicating through a screen. So one of the things that we learned that we needed to do is to teach them to have a conversation. Yeah, you heard me right. Teach them to talk. Teach them to have face-to-face conversation because so much of our ministry, our discipleship and our leadership development models were dependent upon face-to-face -face conversation, right? Um, so not only giving them the skill to initiate conversation, but to be able to sustain a conversation and to go deeper. So what did we do? How did we do that? Uh, so we began to kind of just train the skill of initiating conversation and um, not only initiating, but going deeper in conversation. So we would do it in kind of a, a safe, kind of fabricated environment where we would gather all of our student leaders. InterVarsity is a model that's like contingent upon student leadership. We believe that the college students themselves are the missionaries on the college campus because they're the ones living in the dorms, they're the ones in the college classrooms. So our role as staff, we minister with them. So one of the things we are trying to teach them to do is in a, we'd gather all of our student leaders, pack a dorm room, order some pizza on a Sunday night, 
And we would just do some reps of conversational practice. How do you start a conversation? How do you get into a conversation? And in doing so, in a kind of faith, safe, fabricated environment, they became a lot more comfortable in having conversation. So they grew in not only skill, but in confidence, so that the next week when they were welcoming new students onto campus, literally moving them into the dorm or inviting them into a small group community or sitting across the lunch table with them, looking to get into spiritual conversation, they had both the skill and the confidence to do what we had asked them to do. So that was one of the, uh, the first adaptations we needed to make, and that's just uh, one of many examples. Um, and it's kind of a micro example. I wanna kind of zoom out for a moment and talk about, so over the last um, you know, 10 to 15 years, or even in the last five years, what were some more macro trends that I'm noticing about this generation in regards to communication? And I'm gonna talk about this both on the interpersonal, so one-to-one -one relationship level, as well as organizational level. So what were some things that we need to understand in interpersonal communication? Is that this generation much prefers texting over phone calls or face-to-face uh, -face communication. If you want a quick response, just send a text. You will likely get a reply. It was talked about this morning, Facebook, Facebook is for old people. That's very true. Okay, Facebook is for old people. I'm one of those old people. But Instagram and Snapchat are the apps that they use now. And this is constantly changing. So again, let's not assume we know what they're using. Let's ask them and look to use those things. Um, also, another thing with interpersonal communication is that it's the expectation that you're always available, um, that there is no nine to five. You know, even in ministry, like we could imagine that there's a nine to five. But with younger and younger generations, um, it's always everywhere. You're always available, uh, or that's what, the, that's what the expectation is. When I think about shifts in our organizational communication, what needed to happen, there's some similarities. Again, it's the text over email. Emails are for old people. It's hard to get a response in email with younger generations. Um, the group texting services, I'll just throw one out as an example. Uh, GroupMe is a very popular group social media app that gives all sorts. It's, you know, texting with your group of friends. Uh, but you can put images and GIFs and like people's. It's very popular. So group texting services. Um, sites like YouTube are hot. I mean, I even know this with my nine-year-old daughter. <laughs> YouTube, this generation is looking not for something that's polished, but for something that is real. It's something that's real, something that's entrepreneurial over something that's expert. And um, one more organizational communication trend is the visual over written communication that was talked about this morning. That that is so important in communi communicating to this uh, generation. So those are some of the things that we're learning and have had to adapt. And there's more adaptations on the horizon. One of the things that we're scratching our heads on right now on the college campus is how to, is this okay to go here now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, how to, um, students just aren't showing up to our big events anymore. Our camps and conferences that kind of have traditionally been our major vehicles for discipleship and leadership development, we're really struggling to get students to come to those big events. And once we get them there once, they want to come. But it's that initial ask. And I think there's all sorts of reasons, some of it being financial, some of it being social, anxiety about being away, some of it's their concern for safety, but we're really struggling to recruit to our big events. We're 
a month away from a big fall conference. This Friday is a big deadline, and we're not getting the numbers that we've seen in the past. We're getting them with our upperclassmen students, but not our freshmen and sophomores. So that's something we know that we need to adapt. How we're going to do it, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but I know to stay relevant in this next generation, we need to figure that out. Thank you, Amy. As a researcher, what really caught me and hooked me in our conversation was that, I, that whole that thing about not being able to get them out to events. Because most everything that we've done historically in our organizations is event-based. And if you can't get them to those things, how are you going to engage them? I, I bought my daughter concert tickets to Ed Sheeran. I think that's his name, right? Ed Sheeran, okay. I always say sheer none, and she rebukes me. But anyway, so I, I said, okay, here's the thing. You can pick any seat out between here and here to go to this concert. And she's picking a cheaper seat. And I look, I said, Charlie, you could pick anything in the center. There are better seats. She goes, that one's closest to the exit. And her value proposition was being able to get out of there if something went wrong, which I think they think at a way different level than we do. So Paul, what I, what I love in my conversation with Paul is, is there's something that I always say when I'm, I'm working in organizations, no matter what they are, whether they're a corporation or nonprofit, is that if millennials do not see diversity in an organization, they think something is really wrong with it. And so if they don't see women in leadership, they think something is wrong with that organization. And so I was very fascinated by how, how your multi-generational, multi-ethnic ministry thrives. So I'm looking forward to hearing about it. As a father of a 17-year-old, this has felt more like a parenting seminar <laughs> uh, than anything. I'm taking mad notes over there uh, after Dr. White's explaining the Gen Z. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, happen to, I happen to pastor a church in, in metropolitan Milwaukee uh, that we have kind of, I would say, fallen backwards into being a, a multi-ethnic and a multi-generational church. It wasn't like we had a, a seven-step plan for how to create a multi-ethnic church. It's something I think God builds and and, and so that's what happened. And it's interesting, my 17-year-old daughter has been raised in that church, and we were recently on a college visit, and we're walking around the campus of this university she was considering, and, and she, we, we were, afterwards we are kind of assessing what her thoughts were. She's like, I don't like it. I'm like, why? She's like, it's just all white people. I'm not interested in being in a college with a bunch of white kids, Dad. I don't, I don't want that. I thought, I didn't realize that that had become a, a, just a, a steep core value of hers based on the environment in which she was raised. And so, so our story at Epicos is interesting. So this was, a, this was a church that began about 15 years ago uh, exclusively to college students on the east side of Milwaukee. I was not a part of those early days. In fact, I was born and raised in a town of, of 250 people in western Montana. There was 14 kids in my graduating class, all white, highly homogenous, monochromatic uh, upbringing life. I'd never lived in a town big enough to have a Walmart in my entire life. I was pastoring in northern Wisconsin when I got a phone call from a church in uh, Milwaukee saying, hey, we just bought an old movie theater. We think you might be the right guy to come down and plant a church. And I'm like, Milwaukee isn't like Harlem or Compton. Isn't that like all the same thing? Like I didn't know. I was like so. And I, and I remember driving down. Milwaukee was like this big, it was like Gotham. I didn't know any better. And I remember, and, you know, I came down and I'm, I'm like, Lord, Lord, there's no way. Like I was, at the time I got contacted, I was wanting to buy 20 acres and build a house in the middle so I didn't have to talk to anybody. And then I get this call to come down to Milwaukee. It's, it's interesting how the Lord kind of just changes your heart. But we come down and I, I was wrestling. Like, God, is this what you want? My wife and I were praying about it. In, 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 in ministry that I had done previously, like I was super jacked up and excited about cross-cultural ministry, but that always meant getting on a plane and, and flying to Algeria or Venezuela or Tijuana or going to an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota. I remember praying about, God, do you want me to be here or not? And, and I'm sitting in a lawn chair on 62nd, 63rd and, and National Avenue in, Wisconsin, in, in West Dallas, and I'm just like I'm sitting in front of the building that's now the, our, our location, and I'm thinking, like, Lord, is this what you want? And as I'm looking at the faces of the people driving by in the cars, I saw more non-white faces than I saw white faces. And I remember thinking for the very first time in my life, God has gathered the nations in the city. And you don't have to get on a plane to, and fly across a, a national border to do cross-cultural ministry. You just got to walk across the street. 
And there's every tribe, tongue, language, and people group right here in this neighborhood. And it was like compelling. I'd never thought of that in my life. And so we, we <laughs> I don't know, I still don't know what I'm doing, but I really didn't know what I was doing back then. And we just, you know, got a launch team of a bunch of college kids from the east side of Milwaukee uh, that said, yeah, we'll be on your launch team in West Dallas. So we, we got about 45 or 50 millennials, uh, and we uh, launched our first service ever on June 10th, 2012, and the neighborhood showed up. People that looked like the people in those cars showed up, and I realized I had zero skill set, zero knowledge, zero understanding of how to shepherd a multi-ethnic, multi-generational congregation. I didn't have a clue. And so what, what we did was we just, I just kind of went and shoulder tapped about, about 10 or 12 people that uh, an African-American couple, a couple uh, uh, interracial uh, marriages, uh, um, uh, a family that, was, that were among immigrants, um, uh, some Hispanic uh, couples. And we just, we started meeting every, every month and we were like just trying to get, I was just saying, I'm ignorant, I need to understand this whole thing and, and how to minister and, and shepherd a, a multi-ethnic congregation. And, and what I found was in the process, like the people that were most passionate about fostering multi-ethnicity were these college students, these millennials that were on my, la my launch team. And, and for them, like, I, I, as I got to know them, I began to realize that they had some, um, just some unique uh, convictions that guided them that kind of became our convictions. And, and, and I wrote them down because I'm not, this is not based on research. <laughs> this is just based on my experience of what I saw was the core conviction of, of the younger generation that I was trying to shepherd and, and how that manifested and, and grew into, into what Epicos has become. And if, I'm going to give you the three convictions, and then I'm going to try to unpack them a little bit. The first one is justice. There's a deep, deep, deep concern, like a white-hot passion among millennials for justice. And, and they'll sniff out if you're fake about it very, very quickly. Uh, honesty. I think, I think and I, was, I cut my teeth in ministry kind of in a seeker-driven model early on. Uh, and, and, in the, and I think when I began to talk to, to this younger generation, like, they just wanted honesty. They didn't want a slick presentation. They didn't want, like, a, a really polished thing. They wanted honesty, uh, a spiritual honesty, biblical honesty, relational honesty. They wanted just the realness. And then the last thing is they just, I've seen that they tremendously value real community and being connected, not superficially, but really, like, relationship means everything. And so, so justice and honesty and community, and I've been kind of growing in that over the last seven years trying to figure that out. And how that's manifested in our congregation is we've continued to grow as a multi-ethnic church. We, we, have one, we are one church in three locations, so we're multi-site in Milwaukee. We have a campus that's on Milwaukee's east side, mostly college kids, a white-collar professional, some empty nesters. It's a, pretty, it's, it's a predominantly white congregation. The, the congregation I shepherds in West Dallas, uh, it's the largest of our three congregations. It's, it's, it's probably the most diverse, uh, uh, just a pretty even mix between uh, uh, African-American families, Hispanic families, white families, and then some, we have some immigrant families that are a part of our congregation, but very, and very generationally mixed as well in West Dallas. And then we have a campus we launched two and a half years ago on Milwaukee's north side. And, and that's up, at, it's in, it's in uh, the old Custer High School, Barack Obama High School. And, and what the interesting thing is, is even preaching in this, in this context, because I'll preach on, in West Dallas, which is one unique culture. Then I have to drive in my car to our Northside campus, and I'll preach at our Northside campus, which is a distinctive, unique culture. And then I have to drive to our Eastside campus and preach at our Eastside campus. And so the same sermon's preached in three locations on any given Sunday. And just... And just the, the radical different way the sermon is received, the conversations that you have afterwards, it's just been so interesting. And we've been blessed with being able to build, and we talked a lot about in, in the panels about the, the value of having a represent, representation on your staff and among your leadership. And we've been very, very intentional about that, just trying to make sure that our, our, our staff and our, and our leadership re represent the, 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 the diversity that exists within the congregation. So I'm being very intentional about that. And some of the most... Um, I would say the most transformative experiences in my life and ministry over the last seven years have been those moments with my brothers in Christ and my sisters in Christ who uh, look different than me and whose life experience is radically different than me um, and the willingness to be challenged by them and not just like have my agenda in my back pocket and placate them in a conversation just to tell them what my agenda is, like sincerely with an open heart seeking to learn and hear from what uh, people from different generations and who look different than me, and, and, and being willing to engage different and new material. And, I, and, I, and, I, and as I think about all of this, as I think about, uh, we, like, we're just, I feel like, as a church, we, every, every year we press up against new challenges. It's, it's very difficult. I think John Piper wrote in his book, Bloodlines, something like, like, it's, like, if you look at Revelation 7, and we see every tribe, tongue, language, and people group gathered around the throne, we, we see, like, this is what the kingdom is. It's, it's a multi-ethnic 
kingdom and the church on earth ought to, ought to look like the church in heaven, and we ought to pursue that. Jesus, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, he talked about how, how uh, the, the world would know that he was sent by God, and the world would know that God loves them when they see the oneness in, in the body of Christ. Three times in John 17, 21, 22, and 23, Jesus mentions the, the, the value of oneness within the body of Christ. And the apologetic, sort of evangelistic thrust of the oneness within the body of Christ will be that people will know that Jesus was sent by God and that God loves people. And so like there's this evangelistic thrust even in how Christ prayed for the church. And so knowing that that's exactly what it ought to be, pursuing that is, is so difficult. It is so much easier just to hang out with people that think exactly like you. And, and look exactly like you. In, in millennials, man, they have called us to the carpet again and again. The millennials say, I'm leaving the church unless you start ministering to the poor. You can't say you care about the poor. It's a mandate of the gospel. You have to, you have to get outside the walls of the church. And they hold our feet to the fire. The body of Christ has to be multi-ethnic. Not, not tokenism, but we have to be in community with one another. And so I'll leave with this, this, this one quote that has just really challenged me. Um, it's not my quote. It's, there's an author named Brian LaRich. His father was a pioneer, Crawford, in Campus Crusade for Christ. He is, I think uh, Crawford is one of the first African-American staff members on crew that kind of had a national platform. Brian, his son, is brilliant. He's written a bunch of books. He just came out with an amazing book that I'm reading right now. But Brian's famous statement that's really challenged me, and I think this is just, if I had to boil down everything we're trying to do as a church, it, it would come down to this statement. Without proximity, there will be no empathy. In other words, it is so easy to stay in my little homogenous monochromatic group, look at the other, and with one broad brushstroke say exactly what they are. It's easy to do that generationally. Millennials, you're this way. Gen and Zs, you're this way. Baby boomers, they're that way. Uh, 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 white people are this way. Black people are this way. And it's, if you don't, without proximity, there will be no empathy. It's easy to make those judgments and just walk away and feel like you've got the moral high ground. But with proximity, when you're sitting down with a brother in Christ who looks different than you, and you're talking about life, and you're hearing their story, and they're talking about things that are really divisive and can really rip people, rip communities apart, but you're willing to go there with, with a culture of love and, and openness. You, like, you learn to love and care and listen. And I think it's this marathon approach, this honest approach to journeying in relationship with one another that, that our, our, our churches might actually reflect the way the church is going to be in glory. And it, and it begins with this proximity. So I'll just end with that. Thanks, Paul. Outstanding. All of, all of the panelists, uh, just great job. Let's give them another hand. It, it's so fascinating to hear you talk because I remember early on in my career going to church conferences, church growth conferences, and they were saying that when somebody came into your church, the first thing they wanted to identify was, is anybody else here like me? And yet, look at what you're talking about today with a shift of saying, I want to be with people that aren't like me. And so, great, great word, my friend. Well, good. Um, I've got, well, we've got some questions coming in. Let's see if I, maybe I'll go. I'm going to ask this question that I had prepped for you before, and then we're going to go to these other questions. I'll make sure that the audience gets theirs in. But to all the panelists, I'm asking you this question. What leadership adaptations have you had to make to minister in today's environment? What leadership adaptations have you had to make to minister in today's environment? I'll actually share, um, I'm going to stand up just so everyone can see me. I'm going to share, I'm going to piggyback off. Um, I, when Fred was talking, I didn't know what he was talking about exactly, but what my takeaway from what Fred was talking about was the impact of a coaching culture. And that's an ad adaptation that we too have made in our ministry and university with college students. Is, um, and we've done it in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, giving we use a, a coaching framework called GROW, uh, identify the goal, um, let's talk about reality, okay, what are your options, and then assess the will or kind of the gut. So introducing a coaching framework language-wise as well as um, another adaptation that we've had to make around that coaching culture is that um, from my perspective, students are more hesitant to take on leadership. 
um, and step up to leadership on the college campus than they were eight years ago, 15 years ago. So giving them a partner in ministry, and we've really emphasized the leader apprentice role in ministry. So that's part of the coaching culture that, you know, an upper class student or someone who has experience in ministry would apprentice someone to become a leader in our movement. Um, also, um, taking, I had to realize that stepping up to leadership was risk, it was asking them to take a leadership risk. So part of taking a leadership risk, uh, when you take, a, take any sort of risk, having a good debrief to follow, um, that's another kind of rhythm that we put into our, um, in, into our relationships. So after any kind of new ministry activity they're trying or something they're leading for the first time or even the 15th time, uh, we facilitate a debrief conversation with them and it's something that's, um, another thing I heard Fred say is something that could be reproducible. So they ask questions like, okay, in that experience, what are you learning about, what's something you learned about God? What's something you're learning about yourself through that experience? What's something you're learning about Christian leadership? Um, what, what's something you think you did well? What, if you got the chance to do that over again next week, what would you do differently and why? And those have become really important conversations to have along the way. I'll just add a, a couple of things. I think uh, one of my clear uh, identified spiritual gifts is teaching. Many of you may share that kind of thing. But my leadership adaptation has been I need to major in coaching and minor in teaching. Um, that's, I think that's been one of the, one of the key things that I've seen the transformation in other people uh, where they take ownership for their own life. And then I get, to, I get a chance not to be the hero or the authority figure or the teacher or even the mentor sometimes, but I get to be the guide. I get to be the caring guide, the consistent guide. And I think that's been, that's, that's been a shift. And it's been a shift if you want to use business terms from a wholesale to retail, one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one. Um, and, and it's because that, at that granularity, that personal level, I think that's where the real transformation, the breakthroughs have been happening. And that's the redefining the way I spend my day and the way I look at my calendar and the way I'm going to fill it up and, and those kinds of things have been a, a, a serious thing for me. And that means on the character side, I suppose I'll just add that in, uh, as well. Uh, it means reining in, and uh, my wife and I were talking about this last night, uh, holding our own egos in check uh, to make that happen, uh, to do that because it's really... A, it's, well, as the guy said this morning, it's not about us uh, in that level. When we're able, when we're leading, we want to see something happen in others. That's good. I, I, was, I wrote a piece in an academic journal on how my teaching has changed as a result of my research. And the original model is my favorite model. It's called Sage on the Stage. And you just get to tell people what they ought to know, right? And test them to it. And Allison King out of UCLA wrote a paper, early 90s, that said, we've got to move for 21st century education from sage on the stage to guide on the side, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking yeah. about. And in my piece, I wrote, I think, guide on the side, yes, but now we're at a point of learning with. This discovery together is critically important to them. Good. Did you have a yeah, I would just say, you know, basically piggybacking off everything else that, that, else that is said, it's um, learning to be available, um, and I've drank tons of coffee, a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, um, and it's like you preach a message and you feel like it was self-explanatory or whatever, and then you know, many people just want to, they want to unpack what God stirred up in the midst of the sermon, and they want to have someone to do that with, and, and being willing to invest relationally. So for our a church our size, we're a larger church, several thousand people, so I, I don't do that, but I can't do that as a senior pastor, as, a, as one of the pastors. And so we've had to commit to being very, very, very intentional about raising up uh, disciplers, mentors within the body who can meet with students, meet with other people, having a, having a team of people that we're pouring into that are pouring into people that are pouring into people. So that's just been a leadership adaptation that there's not, it's not the solo pastor model, it's, it's, it's the body ministering to the body. Yeah, that's good. I, it's, it's a real shift from leader-centric models to leadership-centric models where 
we often like to talk about leadership as an individual, but obviously it's, it's not. Uh, here's a great question. It's for Fred from the audience, and I'm really interested in this one. How do, you, uh, how do spiritual coaches get selected, trained, and mentored? I'm, I'm really into the select. How do you select them? <laughs> well, that's what we're working on in staff right now. <laughs> well, we started with staff. We just start. I mean, a lot of the a lot of what we do is what you do. A lot of this is these are I mean, coaching conversations. We use the same grow model, and we it's applied. It's some basic applied powerful questions. That's that's one of the things that we do. We want. To have, for spiritual growth coaching, very specifically, I think, uh, we want people who, who are being coached. Or if you're not being coached, you don't get the relation. It's relationship-based, uh, right? And I think that's one of the keys. Um, uh, somebody that you would want to sit and have a conversation with, able to have, have a conversation, those kinds of skills. Um, and, then, and then we do training. Uh, we've done in-house training. We have a coaching champion on our staff, and she's... She's shifted a lot of her job to, to be doing more of this, and we're, gonna, we're getting um, uh, uh, specialized uh, uh, International Coaching Federation training to do this to keep upgrading our skills. This is something you need to keep getting better at. Yeah. Otherwise, it devolves into advice giving, cleverly veiled advice giving, and that's, uh, that's what we don't want to do. Um, but we've got about another 10 people. When we start, when you coach people for six months, yeah, I think we've been finding, we can start identifying like, no, they're not ready to be a coach. Or yeah, they would be. Really, they get it, right? They get the flow, and they get what happens in that. So um, we're kind of groping our way along intuitively, you know, kind of trial and error towards this right now. All right. So another question from the audience, and I think it feeds off a little bit about what you were talking about, Paul, in your last remarks. In how do each of you cede privilege and power to millennials so they actually lead and not only follow? Um, I think it's, it's, it's not something you would give blindly. You know, it's, it's as you meet with, disciple, learn, understand uh, uh, millennials, where they come from, then you give them increased levels of responsibility. I think, I think we hire millennials, a lot of them. Um, we, love, we give them a seat at the table in the decision-making process, a very important seat at the table. Um, and, and they're speaking into the, they're helping to shape and form the culture of the church, which then permeates through the congregation. Um, so yeah, I would say the vast majority of our, our organic lay leaders and probably over half of our staff would fall into the millennial. So we just give them, not, not blindly, you want to make sure their character's there, the doctrine's there, that they're, that they're ready for that, so that level of leadership and power. You don't just blindly give it away. But you know, if you're actively involved, you're knowing, you're discipling, you're shepherding, you're walking alongside, then man, you invite them, and you learn from it. And, and it's not like, it, you, don't, you don't look down your nose. Like, I mean, I know we can make fun of millennials, but we can learn a lot from millennials. They have a, I mean, they have, a lot to, they have a lot to say to speak into the church, and I think we need to give them a really important place at the table. I love the metaphor, you, you give them a seat at the table. Um, I, I get approached by a lot of organizations, both faith-based and obviously professional associations. And I do a lot of professional associations, like International Society for Equipment Management, Western Telecom Association, some exciting groups, let me tell you, okay? <laughs> And you show up, and everybody is my age or older, and male, and they're saying, Chip, how do we get younger? And I said, well, you got to invite the younger ones in and give them a seat at the table. I said, how, what's your value proposition for them now? They go, well, we send a newsletter out once every four months, and once a year we come to this hotel in Monterey and get hammered together. And I said, I'm all, I'm, you got me at hello, but you're not going to capture them. And so that's a, a, a great distinction. Uh, Amy, there's a question for you here. You ready? Yep. What is a challenge you see particularly in sharing the faith with college students, and how do you overcome that challenge? I'm going to kind of just sit up because I feel like I can't see everyone. <laughs> um, so something from the, I'll build my response to that question on something we heard this morning about basically how do you move from a three to an eight? Um, and I think this question, so can you read the question one more time? 
Yes, I can. <laughs> Let's see. What is a challenge you see, particularly in sharing the faith with college students, and how do you overcome that challenge? So I think one of the first things I would say is, um, so how do we help someone who's kind of on the three end of the spectrum move towards being an eight, which is would probably like someone who's at an eight, they're ready to be asked the question, like, are you ready to follow Jesus? So backing that up a little bit more, uh, we use a continuum in InterVarsity called the five thresholds. And it says, step one, first you just got to build trust with a non-Christian. That's, that's the very first step. I mean, really, it's any relationship is built on trust. So we uh, help our students and us as staff say, okay, before you even think about asking them to follow Jesus or popping that question, do you have trust with them? So if you have trust, you're, that means you're spending time with them, you're doing life with them, and hopefully as a believer, as a Christian, you're living your life differently in such a way that would evoke curiosity. So the second step is that you're helping them to become curious. Why do you do that? Why do you say that? Why do you not do this or do that? So in your lifestyle as Christians, you're evoking curiosity in the life of a non-believer. Second is that, uh, again, through relationship, living life together, you're hopeful, hopefully um, helping them to be open to change in their life. The reality is, is that we can't change anyone. We, it's not, our job is not the transformation to transform the life of someone. Only the Holy Spirit can bring conviction of sin and bring change. So the third step is, are they open to change? in life, in their life. So are they convicted of a sin that they need to change? Um, so that, that I think is the third thing. And then uh, the fourth thing is, um, are, they, um, are they beginning to seek, uh, seek after Jesus? Like they're beginning not just to respond to your own invitations, but to pursue Jesus on their own. And this could look differently. Maybe it's attending a worship service on a weekend or attending a small group Bible study um, or having a spiritual conversation with a friend that goes a little bit deeper. Uh, and then finally, it's the following Jesus. Are you ready to follow Jesus? So I think it's not just a one, you know, so how are we helping to share the faith? I actually don't think it's just one step in the process is what I'm trying to communicate. It's actually there's multiple kind of thresholds that you have to um, cross with the life of an individual in order that they can hear the gospel and then respond to it. Question from the audience. Um, I'll take this one. Haven't tensions always existed between generations? Now, what's my rock band's name? Demographic metabolism. Yes, absolutely. They have always existed between generations. Is there anything different about tensions today? Like I shared, I, I just think you have such large birth cohorts and, and struggling for the leadership of our institutions. But I will say this, when I talked about the redefinition of relationship to authority that's taken place, there was a study done in the 50s by Geert Hofstede, who was a Dutch sociologist. He did it for IBM. And they went all over the world, and the IBM wanted to know, when we go to this country and work, how can we be culturally compliant or sensitive? And so Geert did his work, and he came out with five dimensions of culture, and one of them was called power distance. And so he found in different cultures there was a different power distance. So in a high power distance culture, it would be very unlikely for a subordinate to challenge an authority figure or someone younger. In a low power distance country, it would be more appropriate or more acceptable for that to happen. So Israel was the lowest power distance country in his study. And the highest power distance country was Japan, followed by Mexico. My work now is global because where power distances differed around the world between generations, those subordinates, 
challenging superiors, today everybody's a low power distance. So one of the reasons we're seeing more and more attention is that a young person can go to Paul and say, look, unless you start doing this, I'm out of here. And challenge his authority, challenge his leadership. And so what we're seeing is that here's what happens with young professionals today. And I use that term because there's something going around called millennial fatigue. Okay? Millennial fatigue is that they're tired of hearing negative stuff about their generation over and over and over again. And I don't blame them for that. But here's what I have to say to my young professional friends here today. Get over it. You're the largest generation to ever walked the face of the earth. You just can't get emotionally hooked by this stuff. But my concern is for this generation is that when we don't listen, we don't embrace them, is that they will walk with their feet. They will never protest with their voice. They'll just be gone in the term we call ghosting, right? You just won't see them again. All right, so we have another question. Um, balancing ministry with older generations with reaching and engaging younger folks. Is a multi-generational church really possible? It's a great question. I just want to share a story. My, I became a senior pastor when I was like 30. And it was, our church had gone through, my former church, it had gone through a really bad transition. The boss had, you know, everything, he did everything wrong. <laughs> Every sensational, <laughs> glorious, horrible sin he did. So our church was really, really wounded. And uh, we, were a, we were an older church. It was a very, uh, it, was, it, was, it was multi-generational, but basically mostly like family and older, like mid-30s up to, you know, 70s and 80s, a lot of retired folks. Went for a year without a senior pastor, and then I became a senior pastor. I should have never in a zillion years been a senior pastor, but they, 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 hired, they hired me and installed me as a lead pastor. And the thing that was amazing to me was that could have been an adversarial thing with, with the older folks. They could have thought, oh, who's this kid? In fact, the, the title was senior pastor, but one of the older ladies in the church said, I don't want to call you senior anything. Can we change your title to lead pastor? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, call me lead pastor. I don't care. So I changed my title. But what I learned in the, in the five years of, of, of leading Faith Community Church uh, was that like the generation, that, the, the people that supported me the most and loved me the most were the retired folks, were the older folks. Because they, they had the number one, they, had, they, had, they, they funded the thing because they all had money. None of the younger, none of the younger folks did. But what they, they wanted to see, they wanted to see people won to Christ. They wanted to see an impact for Jesus happen. And they were okay with listening to music they didn't necessarily like. At least I discovered this. And, and, and they, were, they were okay with even, even laying down some of their things, their preferences, for the sake of fruitful, effective gospel ministry. And then, and then the, the, the response for me was like, I, I wanted to be around these folks. I, I, mean, I, was, I was a kid, and I knew I was a kid. And so I... I I, made my, I would go to their jubilee gatherings and I would, you know, drink tea with them and just listen to them. And, and man, they, like, of all the people that supported me and loved me when I was at that church, it was this older generation. Because, like, they wanted to see God glorified. They wanted to see the, our community transformed by the gospel. And when they saw that we were doing that, they were okay with some of the, the cultural differences because they were, their, their desire to see Christ glorified was bigger than their preference. Excellent. Excellent. Fred, to piggyback on what Paul is saying, because primarily in a coaching mentoring situation, the, the I guess historically it is it is there's a power distance there, and so is it usually older people doing the coaching mentoring to these younger people, or do you have younger people doing the coaching and mentoring as it well? Flow, it flows. Is this on? Yes. Okay. It it flows every direction. Um, I'm getting I'm getting coached by a woman who's 36, uh, so it it doesn't it does it really is who do I feel comfortable talking to, Ooh. who gets me, who's listening, who cares, who's um, who's tracking, who will follow up with me, um, and uh, it 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 matters less. I think some of the generational things matter less at that stage. Um, uh, I think just in terms of specifically with the with the coaching conversation, I do, I do want to just mention some of this dynamic. I think for us, anyhow, leadership is key for a congregation, a multi-generational congregation. And there's you know, so many stories of the older generation not wanting to hand the baton and not wanting to share the power and all that. That is an art-specific issue. I think one of the things we're struggling right now is ready to hand the baton of leadership to, are people ready to grab it? 
And I think the, it's not whether they're, they're ready, it's are you ready to grab it? I want to grab it, I really want to, and I have all these ideals, and I want to do these things. I want honesty and real community and justice. I'm so busy. <laughs> I mean, this is where so many of our things are tripping up in terms of actually implementing them. Yeah. It's not just attitudes, it's, li it's the lives we're leading, and it's the crazy, stupid busyness of people to say, especially for an idealistic generation who, I really want it to be this way, I really, really want it, I don't want to do the trade-offs, I don't want to compromise, and I can't be there on a consistent basis to build it. And I think this is where we're kind of getting stalled and stuck. I, I don't know um, uh, the, for the rest of you, but that's, that's one of our enduring challenges at this stage of saying, we're ready, attitudinally, let's do this, and anybody gonna grab the baton right yeah. now? That's an that's a excellent observation, absolutely. Um, there's a great question that came from the audience and it really is one of, my, one of my major concerns. When people ask me, Chip, what would most concern you about the millennial population? And the, the answer to that is really pretty easy, resiliency. And I'm, I'm concerned they, they're a generation that we haven't allowed to be sad, okay? And, and so to some degree, uh, part of it is, I think, parenting styles have changed. I think parents are, I think one of the things is just overly invested emotionally and psychologically in their kids. And their kids feel the tension and pressure of that. And so here's, here's, the, here's the question. There are two of them that came in on the same thing. And I, I'm gonna read them both to you and then give, and Amy, perhaps, you're closer to this than anybody. And I know, well, I'm just gonna read it. Mental health challenges, depression, anxiety, panic attacks are at an epidemic proportions, yet church does not often deal with this. Hidden issue, question mark, opportunity, question mark. And this other one, what's behind the huge increase in social anxiety? Can the church address this? Yeah, I can speak to that first. I think this is one of the things that perhaps makes me the most sad <laughs> as I work with college students um, is just the, the amount of um, anxiety, social anxiety that they have. And I think technology contributes to that. Um, that was talked about this morning, the bullying on social media, the the, re, the simple reality is that uh, what people post <laughs> about themselves is kind of the bright, shiny stuff, but that's what often gets compared. You know, so people are comparing kind of th their life to what is the perception of other people's life, lives, and that produces a lot of depression and anxiety and... Uh, I, you know, just, I'm on a lot of college campuses all the time. I see more and more flyers on the back of bathroom stalls about counseling services, um, um, dogs on campus. Um, what are they called? Uh, com yeah, comfort, comfort dogs, all of that. Um, and I think that's, I mean, those are real problems um, and you know those are all attempts to kind of heal deeper wounds and you know I'm convinced that until they find Jesus like the, we're going to fall short <laughs> in our efforts um, to minister to them but the need is definitely there. It's interesting you had mentioned the, the flyers I teach at UCLA as well in their executive program so I'm walking through the hallway and I saw like 10 of these posters that had the tear off tabs at the bottom yeah and so on there were six posters in this one hallway and all but two of the tabs had already been torn off and this was the first week of school coming back and and so it is a it, it is fascinating here's here's a generation they know that people have a hope for them and are highly invested in them and they don't want to disappoint and so even our kids that have faith, that are grounded, do not want to disappoint 
you. And so I, I think that's a real challenge for us to pay attention to. And I think whoever asked that question, you're really ahead of the curve when it comes to the church. I mean, just as in American society, we struggle with this issue. And I think in the church, we've always struggled with this issue, particularly, you know, serious uh, mental illness. Anybody else want to take that one on? So, um, yeah, my wife, one day my son, Chandler, comes home, four, fourth grader, and he's sad. He's got these huge dimples. And his mom says, what's the matter, Chandler? He said, TJ didn't invite me to his birthday party. She goes, oh, that's okay. I'm going to take you to Disneyland tonight. And I heard that, and I said, Lisa, come here. In the kitchen. I said, you can't take him to Disneyland just because he's sad. Maybe he just did something stupid, and he deserves not to go. <laughs> and she goes, well, no, he would never do that. <laughs> and I said, I said, are you kidding me? She goes, are you going golfing tomorrow? And I said, yeah. She goes, you want to be sad? I go, no, go ahead and go. <laughs> so... Um, I had one, another question here. I'm going to go back to what, one of my questions in here is, uh, what is the greatest challenge that you experience, individually, each of you, in working with younger workers, younger ministers? I asked my wife this. Her, her staff is, I think, almost entirely millennials. She has four people that work for her. And she said um, the busyness thing. She, they're just so overcommitted that it's, it's, it's very difficult to get, and even not only staff members, just the men and women in our congregation, like just getting millennials to step into a volunteer ministry role just to try to find the margin and the time is, is for her, it's been the most difficult part of the process. And for me, it's, 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 it's a marathon. You know, if you, if you want to make things happen, you want to, you want to just rock and roll and, and push forward in ministry, like you can't, like, I mean, back to the previous question, you need to sometimes, I mean, I think this is shepherding 101, you need to be willing to sit in the ashes with people who are in the ashes and cry with them and not try to get them out of the ashes too soon. And I think that's just shepherding. And so I think in the, the highly relational, community-driven uh, DNA of, of, of the millennial generation that's greater than my generation, it just re it requires a lot of personal investment. And if you just want to get stuff done and plow through people, it's just it's not going to work. Yeah, I already mentioned the, the, the kind of clash of, of busyness and idealism. I, I think what, in, in, a, in our smaller church setting, what we're seeing that ends up in is the, so the big answer is we're all swimming in the, in the waters of consumerism. And I think uh, people, we all, including millennials, default to consumerism, right? I really, want it, I really, really want it to be a certain way. It's not that way. I don't have time to be here all the time to fix it and to make it that way. I'm out, right? And, and that they're not happy with that trade-off. They're not happy with how that happens, sometimes not knowing how to work through some of those conflicts to, to know how to talk to each other, right? You know, having those conversations, um, which is tough. So th that's a kind of a atmospheric thing, I think, that we, we deal with sometimes. And then on the very, you know, the, just ego issues <laughs> for all of us uh, that, that uh, come into play. High, Fragile self-esteem, no self-esteem. You know how how does all those all those things kind of play out in in um, in working together and doing those things? So, which is what all of us deal with all the all the time. Those kinds of issues as well. So, yeah. Amy. Yeah. So the question that you gave us was, what's the greatest challenge when it comes to ministry with? 20-somethings, so this has brought, been brought up multiple times today, and I think it is that conjunction phrase, with. It's not two or four, mm -hmm. uh, but it's with. So it's um, no matter what generation any one of us is, um, it's learning to, um, to uh, humble ourselves and to posture ourselves as the learner. And uh, you mentioned the low power distance. Thing. So um, speaking in my, my experience as a manager, um, so I work on a management team, our larger leadership team for a five-state region, there's about 20 of us on our team, and the majority of them are uh, millennials. Um, 
So I think the, one of my challenges working with them is to just under, I'm a Gen Xer, is just understanding kind of just because I'm higher on the org chart doesn't mean that uh, what I say is better or more important or should be implemented just because I have more gray hair. <laughs> so, you know, that is um, the power of ministry with. Um, I think it's a challenge, but uh, it's so worth it. And we actually, uh, when we do that well, uh, the ministry is better, the gospel is proclaimed, um, and uh, people come to know Jesus. One of the things that I would say is we look at transitioning them into leadership roles. In my most recent book was Millennials Who Manage. I identified a couple things that they struggle with. One thing I always say about this population is ambiguity is their kryptonite. <laughs> if you want to freak them out, be ambiguous about something. <laughs> and partly because in the educational system, our syllabi, they lay out step by step how to get an A all the way through it. So a lot of times, baby boomers and Gen X were trained in a way that it was throw a problem at them, they went and fixed it and brought it back fixed. Millennials are very competent and bright, but they expect a guidebook, a syllabus, to fix the problem. And sometimes they feel set up for, by failure. And that would lead into their inability to want to take more responsibility sometimes, because it's too ambiguous for them. So ambiguity is their kryptonite. And the second thing is, they will make decision by indecision. Not because they're not brilliant, it's that they don't want to make a bad decision. And so many times the decisions they make default to indecision and they have a decision that they don't really want to live with. So those two things I would pay attention and develop. Now partly to learn how when I start seeing somebody get comfortable with ambiguity and able to make decisions, then they're ready for leadership. And you have to create an environment that it's okay to make a mistake. That's critical for them, because they haven't been allowed to fail for the most part of their lives. Two dynamics in relationship change with them when you put them into leadership. Number one, the dynamic with their friends. They feel ostracized and apart from the group, because now they're the manager, they're the boss. And so they feel lonely. And so to pay attention to that with them, and so sometimes their temptation is to become more lenient on peers to get that relationship back, but really that's not what happens. They get more harsh on their peers. Why are you giving our generation a bad name? You know, grow up, those types of things. The other relationship that changes is the person that promoted them. And so here's what happens, is that they have the person that promoted them on one shoulder and their own ideas on the other shoulder. And they have this inner tension. Should I do it the way the person that promoted me does it or should I do it my way? Make it comfortable for them to do things their way and be more authentic. Thank you, I believe we're done.